Greetings and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. And in this episode of Word Magazine, I'm going to continue uh, the series that I started last time doing some review and some responses to an appearance of uh, Dr. Peter Gurry of Phoenix Seminary in Phoenix, Arizona, and Pastor Elijah Hickson of the Fireside Fellowship Church in Kingston, Tennessee, as they were on the uh, podcast of um, Dwayne Green, who is a Pentecostal uh, minister up in Canada, who sometimes on his podcast uh, focuses on things related to textual criticism. And he did a series uh, back several months ago talking about the received text. And uh, in the last, my last podcast, I did uh, played a little excerpt from part one of his interview with uh, Dr. Gurry and Pastor Hickson, uh, in which they were discussing their going on the record to uh, say that they were seeking out the original text or the autograph. And I suggested that when we look at their writings, that it doesn't seem to be the thing that they actually say that they're pursuing in their written work. And I want to move on now to uh, play a little clip from part two of the interview that Dwayne Green had with Dr. Gurry and Pastor Hickson. And this was posted to YouTube on December the 27th of 2021. And I'm going to play a little bit longer clip and I'll probably stop and start it some. And the, the topic of this particular episode uh, was, um, are the longer ending of Mark and the woman caught in adultery original? And so they're discussing the two biggest textual variants with respect to the number of verses within the New Testament, the so-called longer ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20. I prefer to call it the traditional ending of Mark. And also the woman taken in adultery from John 7, 53 through 8, 11. In this review that I'm doing today on my podcast, I'm just going to focus on the first part of that. And I was really intrigued by some of the things that were said about the ending of Mark, the traditional ending of Mark, particularly from Dr. Gurry, where at one point he suggests that Mark 16, 9 through 20 should be treated in the way that the Protestant uh, Orthodox treated uh, the books that were in the Apocrypha. And so I want to look at that. Uh, it's a very interesting, kind of a novel suggestion as I see it. And I really want to ask the question in this podcast, should Mark 16, 9 through 20 be relegated to the Apocrypha? So we're going to pick it up here at about the 1 minute and 26 second mark. I will, when I uh, post um, this podcast online, I will post an article at my blog, jeffriddle.net, and I'll have a link to the original um, interview with uh, Dr. Gurry and Pastor Hickson with Dwayne Green for those who want to listen to the entire podcast in its context. So uh, again, let's pick it up here at about the one minute and 26 second mark. It's super helpful. So with that being said, would yeah. you guys be willing to go on record and tell me, do you guys think the long ending of Mark should be part of scripture or do you think that there's enough to push it away? All right. So he goes, he asked them to go on the record again, just like he did when he asked them about uh, whether or not they were seeking the original autograph. So he wants them to go on the record with whether or not Mark 16, 9 through 20 is authentic and original to Mark. And so let's listen to the response that uh, is received. I wouldn't like the language of should be scripture because that's God's God, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of an interesting statement. He says, I don't like the, the language of should it be scripture because that's God's job, not mine. Now, as you listen to the rest of this, I want to ask you to ask yourself, is that consistent, that sort of um, denial. I, I don't want to really answer that because that's that's God's job, not mine. Is that really consistent with the answer that Dr. Gurry ends up giving 
with regard to Mark 16, 9 through 20. I mean, to me, it seems like, I don't know what we would call it, um, you know, false humility. Maybe it's, I don't want to be held accountable for the positions that I take. He's going to be at, you're, you're asked a straight out question. If you ask that question to me, I'm going to give you a straight out answer. Yes, it should be included. Why? Because it's God breathed scripture and it should be included in the text of our Bibles and it should be preached. But he's going to try to, you know, equivocate and say, well, I don't really want to say, should it be, um, I, I, you know, so I want to qualify this. Listen, you know, if you take your position that it's not authentic, it's not original, own that and stand by that. I've got more respect for somebody who owns their position, but it's going to have to be, you know, as is typical with modern proponents of modern textual criticism, particularly if they're evangelicals, it always has to be steeped uh, in nuance and explanations and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we can ask the question whether the evidence suggests that it is or not. <laughs> right. Okay. Let me... What's the difference between asking the question, does the evidence suggest it should be part of the Bible, and answering straight out the question, should it be part of the Bible? Let me rephrase. Do you think the evidence suggests that Mark 16, 9 through 20 should remain in the text of Scripture or that it shouldn't? Thanks, Samuel. I, I, I'll give you a quick answer. I think it should still be in our Bibles, and I think it should be marked in some way to indicate why most New Testament scholars do not think it's original to Mark's gospel, right? Okay, so he thinks it should be in the Bible, but there should be markers indicating why the majority of scholars don't believe it should be in the Bible. Is that is that clear enough so is he is he advocating that we should have uninspired writings within our bibles as long as there's an editorial notation saying that that the majority of scholars believe that this insertion should not be part of the bible so it should be in the bible as long as we indicate that it shouldn't be part of the bible so right. my, my own personal preference would be to describe it something as like an ancient appendix. And then there's another question we have to ask as to whether we should read that ancient appendix on the same level as we read the rest of Mark's gospel or not. I Is that clear enough to you? It should be considered an ancient appendix and uninspired, spurious appendix, fabricated appendix. And then there should be another discussion as to whether it should be treated as on par with the rest of the scriptures. But... If it's an uninspired, spurious, fabricated edition, then we wouldn't put it on par with the rest of the scriptures, would we? I used to answer that question yes and say yes, because it's been it's it's in so many Greek manuscripts, right? Like all but two or three. Mm -hmm, right. The church has clearly read it as scripture for most of its history until the last two or three hundred years, let's say. So let's keep doing the same thing. More recently, I have shifted my opinion, whereas I think, no, if there really is good evidence that it's not original to Mark's gospel, then we should treat it like other texts that are not original to Mark's gospel. The way I would think... All right, let me just pause here. This is kind of interesting. Now, Dr. Gurry confesses to us that his opinion on Mark 16, 9 through 20 has shifted. In fact, I, I believe that one of the very first interactions that I ever had with Peter Gurry was when I did a paper at the Houston Baptist Theological Conference, Theology Conference in Houston, Texas, at Houston Baptist University. And I did a paper on the ending of Mark as a canonical crisis. And Peter Gurry wasn't there, but his colleague uh, from Phoenix Seminary, John Mead, was. And I think Mead knew that Gurry was interested in the ending of Mark, or he just sent him... I think maybe a picture of the, the conference schedule and he saw there that I had done the paper and he, Peter Gurry emailed me and I sent him my paper and the paper that I did there ended up actually, uh, I turned it into an article that appeared in the Puritan Reform Journal and that was my first contact with him. Now at the time, uh, he had the view that was the same view as Samuel Tregalis and also the same view as Bruce Metzger uh, and I think we could say it's also po the position of David Allen Black at the South Eastern Seminary, uh, something like it. They're not all those views are not carbon copies of one another. But the basic uh, uh, se sense of this view is that Mark sixteen nine through twenty was not written by Mark. It was not originally the ending of Mark, but it was written by some other early writer 
And I'm not even sure they would say it was inspired, but they would say it was canonical. And so even though it's not Markan, it's, it's, it's the canonical text of Mark. And so it should be included. And he, again, he had a more Tregalian view, but now he's telling us his view on Mark 16, 9 through 20 has shifted. He now has a different view. And now he thinks that it is not only secondary, it's an ancient appendix and it is spurious. And so it, 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 it is a foreign intrusion into the text of Mark. Let's listen as he explains this a little bit further. Think about it now is a bit like the Protestant reformers thought about the Apocrypha. If you go back to the early Protestant Bibles, including the King James right, Version, right. Yep. they all include the Apocrypha, but they are usually marked in some way to distinguish them. And in something, say, like the Geneva Bible of 15th century. Well, let me pause there for a second, because I, I, this is the point that when I listen to this, that, you know, it my you know, hairs on my, you know, arms stood up like, what did he just say? And so he suggested that he wants to treat Mark 16, 9 through 20 in a manner that is akin to the way the Protestant reformers treated the Apocrypha. And of course, we're talking about the Apocrypha. We're talking about those parts of the Old Testament that were included in the Old Testament by the Roman Catholics that were affirmed in uh, the, the Council of Trent, and uh, that they were, um, you know, the, the, the secondary uh, books that were called the Deuterocanonicals. And yes, in some of the early Protestant translations of the Bible, like Luther's translation uh, and the Geneva Bible and the King James Version, they included the Apocrypha. But what did they do with the Apocrypha? They put the Apocrypha together in a separate section. They were not in the Old Testament. And with the Apocrypha, we're not talking about anything from the New Testament. There are no New Testament Apocryphal books that were printed with the Apocrypha, but they, they printed them separately as sort of like a study aid, historical aid, a resource for the reader. The Old Testament is clearly set apart as Scripture. The New Testament is clearly set apart as Scripture. But the Apocrypha is gathered together um, and it's clearly demarcated as not part of the Bible. And this was particularly important in the Protestant confessions. They identified the Apocrypha as not being part of canonical Scripture. And let's just briefly look at a couple of early confessions of faith. And we could start with the so-called Second Helvetic Confession of Faith of 1566, which addresses the Apocrypha. Uh, it, and it says there uh, in the opening chapter, which is related to the doctrine of Scripture. I mean, first of all, it lists, it lists out um, the, 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 um, the fact that Scripture is... Uh, what canonical scripture is. And then at the end of that very first chapter of the Holy Scriptures being the true word of God, it addresses the Apocrypha. And it says, and yet we do not deny that certain books of the Old Testament were by the ancient authors called apocryphal and by others ecclesiastical, to wit, such as they would have to be read in the churches, but not alleged to avouch or confirm the authority of faith by them. So they were read as aids, as early ecclesiastical writings, but they were not used to avouch or confirm the authority of the faith. Then you have um, the uh, Gaelic Confession of 1559 that Calvin uh, helped to uh, craft. And also in the very uh, opening chapter, there is a discussion of uh, the doctrine of the scriptures are towards the opening in i think it's the third chapter it says the holy scriptures are comprised in the canonical books of the old and new testaments and it lists the 39 books of the old testament the 27 books of the new testament and then uh it, afterwards it says uh the following um this is i think article four 
we know these books, the 66 canonical books of the Old New Testaments, to be canonical and the sure rule of our faith not so much by the common accord and consent of the church as by the testimony and inward illumination of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to distinguish them from other ecclesiastical books upon which, however useful, we cannot found any articles of faith. And so a clear distinction is drawn between canonical books and non, the non-canonical apocrypha. And then it's nowhere more clearly distinguished than in the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, picked up uh, by the Savoy Declaration and the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, where in uh, the opening chapter on Scripture, and I'm looking at the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, in chapter 1, paragraph 2, it says, Under the name of Holy Scripture or the Word of God written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testaments, which are these. And it lists then the 39 books of the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament. And it says then, all of which are given by the inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. Citing 2 Timothy 3.16 as the proof text. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Then paragraph 3, chapter 1 says, the books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon or rule of the scripture, and therefore are of no authority to the church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. So yes, in some early printings of the Bible, not only did they include the Old and New Testament, but they did include in some early printings, the Apocrypha, but they clearly set them apart in a separate section. The books were not dispersed among the canonical books. And I think this is a really key point that needs to be made. In this episode, uh, Dwayne Green even posts in the background uh, a picture that is taken from the table of contents from an early printing of the King James Version. And you see very clearly that Again, there's the Old Testament, there are the books of the Old Testament, there are the books of the New Testament, and in between them, there are the books called Apocrypha. And in the, this printing of the King James Version, it has Esdras, Second Esdras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther. It, it then has um, the, the wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon, then Ecclesiasticus, and then it has the book of Baruch, uh, with the epistle of Jeremiah, the song of the three children, the song of Susanna, the idol bell and the dragon, the prayer of Manasseh, and then first and second Maccabees. And again, what, what stands out to me about this is that that undermines Gurry's suggestion here that he wants to treat Mark 16, 9 through 20, the way that the Protestant Orthodox uh, treated the Apocrypha is the, the, the Protestant Orthodox did not uh, take parts of the Apocrypha and leave it within the Old Testament. Um, again, let's look at uh, what it calls uh, the rest of Esther. Well, if you look at the book of Esther uh, in the Septuagint, there are additions uh, to the book of Esther that are not found in the Hebrew Masoretic text of Esther. In fact, there are some six editions that are in the book of Esther that was in the, the Septuagint. And again, the Roman church retained those additions to the book of Esther as being authentic, whereas the Protestants, like the Jews, rejected those additions to Esther. And so if you were to look at the book of Esther, you, you would see that they made additions that would be at chapter 11, verse 2, through what they called chapter 12, verse 6, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, chapter 13, 8 through 14, chapter 15, 1 through 16, 16, 1 through 24, and 10, 4 through 11, 1. If you had a Roman Catholic Bible, that would be the way they would do the chapters and the ver versification. But see, my point is 
the Protestant reformers and the Protestant Orthodox didn't include those additions to Esther within the book of Esther with brackets put around them. No, they took them completely out and put them in a totally separate section telling the reader these are not on par with the Old Testament and New Testament. And they did the same thing with the additions to the book of Daniel. Um, if you look at the book of Daniel, there is an insertion that is made in the book of Daniel uh, in the third chapter, that is the song of the three children, the song of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, there's also an addition in the book of Daniel uh, that is encompasses uh, in the um, Roman Catholic versions of the book of Daniel an extra chapter, chapter 13, which is the story of Susanna. And then there's a chapter 14, Bell and the Dragon. And the point is when the Protestant reformers and the Protestant Orthodox uh, composed their Bibles, they didn't include the story of Susanna as Daniel 13 with brackets put around it and a note to the reader. This does not appear in some of the most ancient manuscripts. They did not include the account of the idol bell and the dragon as Daniel 14 with brackets around it and, and, and with a note to the reader saying this is not part of the earliest and best manuscripts of the book of Daniel. No, they, they took it completely out of the text proper and relegated it to a separate section that's labeled the books called Apocrypha. And then in their Confessions of Faith, they clearly delineated the difference between inspired scripture and ecclesiastical writings that might be edifying in the way that other kinds of uninspired writings might be edifying or helpful to provide historical background, etc., but not a, a part of the text of scripture. And so to suggest that he wants to treat Mark 16, 9 through 20, the way the Protestant Orthodox treated the Apocrypha is simply uh, inaccurate. The Protestant reformers and the Protestant Orthodox were not in favor of including uninspired writings within the body of the collection of the canonical literature, putting it in brackets and leaving notes uh, for the reader to sort through it. Um, that's not what they did. And it's only been since the, the 19th century that modern scholars came up with this idea of leaving these parts of the text that they hold to be spurious within the text and putting brackets around it and including notes. Um, this is not consistent with what the Protestant reformers or the Protestant Orthodox did with respect to books that they rejected as spurious. Again, I don't think Mark 16, 9 through 20 is spurious. I think it's authentic and it should be included. And, you know, I, I wish that people who reject the authenticity of it would go all the way. If you reject the authenticity of it, take it out of your Bible. Why don't they take it out of the Bible? Because they fear the backlash uh, from people who recognize that it is scripture because the sheep have long heard the voice of their shepherd in Mark 16, 9 through 20. All right, let's pick up uh, a continuation now of Dr. Gurry's comments. Distinguish them. And in something, say, like the Geneva Bible of 1560, there's a very clear introduction saying, we do not read these books on par with scripture, but they are useful and they are especially useful for illustrating the doctrinal truths that are taught in the rest of scripture. Right, right. And, so and they did not leave them in the text with brackets around them. They did not include the additions to Daniel and the additions to Esther within the text proper. They completely removed them from the authentic text of the Old Testament. So I think when you look at something like Mark 16, 9 through 20, I don't see anything in there that is theologically problematic at all. In other words, there's no scandal in my mind about the fact that the church has read this text as scripture for most of its right, history. Right, right. And I think there's no scandal that people continue to do so today. And I would have... I agree there's no scandal because I believe it is scripture. However, if I did not believe it was scripture, I do believe I would be scandalized by saying the church has erroneously embraced a text that is not truly scripture for thousands of years in error. 
no problem with the church that does because mm. I don't think they're going to be led astray at any point. Would you preach from it? I would not. And I used to say I would, and that's kind of the big change. Right, I would right. but, I have, but when I've been asked... So I want you to get this. In this age, we have evangelical New Testament textual critics who are telling us we can have passages within our Bibles that are not inspired and should not be preached on, but they can be included within the text of Scripture as long as they're put in brackets and they're interpretive notes to the reader. Um, we've never had this in Protestantism until the 19th century, people who have suggested uh, such a way of handling things. In fact, I was just recently asked to. Mm -hmm. What I did was I preached the truths that are in there, you see. Right, gotcha. I would distinguish that from preaching it. In other words, going back to the Protestant Reformers distinction, I would not want to found doctrine on the longer ending of Mark, but where, right. where the longer ending of Mark illustrates, reinforces, or repeats things that are taught elsewhere in Scripture, I have no problem using that text to illustrate them, support them, right, all that. And it does. That's yep. what Let's pause here for a second. Again, this is another point of, I think, deep confusion. What he's suggesting to us is that we can have uninspired writings, that we can preach them, and that uninspired writings can have truths in them that we can preach without reference to the text itself. And so he's saying we can we can preach the truths within Mark 16, 9 through 20, even if we don't think it's inspired. This very much reminds me of what John Piper has said about um, the passage of the woman taken in, uh, in adultery. He says it's a true story, whether it really happened or not. And, and so even if it's spurious, there can be some so-called truth in it. And my question is, where, what are the limits to this? Can you preach from the book of Enoch? Um, can you preach from the Apocrypha? Um, can you preach from Shakespeare if he says things that are true about humanity? And how does this fit with the exhortations that we have, like from the Apostle Paul? Let the word of of Christ dwell in you richly. What about when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2 and said, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. When Paul said preach the word, was he talking about preaching the scriptures or was he talking about preaching any kind of document as long as it had some so-called truth in it? And who gets in the end to adjudicate what truth is and whether truth is found in spurious writings? This seems to be opening a, a Pandora's box that, that would just undermine completely the, uh, the, the epistemic authority of the Bible as what the Christian preachers preach. We don't preach um, disconnected truths, we preach the word of God. We preach the scriptures. Now he's going to say, well, wait a second. The ending of Mark, it has, it has things uh, about Jesus that are found elsewhere in the Bible. But again, we're not commanded to preach uninspired writings. I'm not going to go into the pulpit this Sunday and say, I'm going to preach Calvin's Institutes, as laudable as Calvin's Institutes might be. I'm certainly not going to go in the pulpit and say, I'm going to, I'm going to preach, you know, John Piper's uh, Desiring God or something like that. I'm going to preach the scriptures. I'm going to preach the word of God. But let's listen to him as he continues the explanation. Well, that's my yeah. point, right? It's like it talks about the ascension. Great. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about the ascension. Exactly. It talks about the resurrection. Great. Let's talk about the resurrection. <clears throat> Everything in the long running of Mark, as far as I can see, is supported elsewhere in Scripture, and so is true in that sense. Right. But I would not treat it in the same way I treat the rest of inspired Scripture. So you wouldn't so. hold a basket full of snakes in front of you and that... <laughs> Why is it every time people talk about Mark 69 through 20, they have to make some kind of curious um, statements about um, the references to the sign gifts and to um, taking up serpents? Um, as I've explained many times, it's actually a very important passage. It's talking about the sign gifts that were given to the apostles. 
Um, and it's a very important passage with respect to continuationism. Now, Duane is a Pentecostal pastor, and we would have a very different view on the sign gifts. I would see the sign gifts as having ceased because they were limited to the apostles and the age of the apostles. And I would actually see the passage that he's making fun of as being a very important passage for making that, that key point. Of course, he's a continuationist. And if he's a continuationist, though, and he later says he accepts Mark 16, 9 through 20, I wonder how he handles that passage. But I certainly don't think it's a passage that should be ridiculed. And at least I think uh, Pastor Hickson is going to point in, uh, is going to um, point out rather, that um, there is a reference uh, in the book of Acts to the Apostle Paul being bitten by a viper. So anyway, let's continue the discussion here. Down a, down a thing of antifreeze, eh? I would, I would hesitate <laughs> to do that, right? But, but I would hesitate to do that even if I thought it was the inspired scripture. Okay. Good, good. But you still have, you know, snakes and, and acts. That's right. right. Yeah. And Where you have Paul scorpions gets... in Luke. People always forget the scorpions in Luke. In Luke, Jesus says you can you be stung by scorpions and you'll be okay, right? Yeah, well, he makes a great point there. When Christ instructs the 70 and sends them out in Luke 10 and verse 19, uh, there certainly is an instruction that sounds very much like the uh, instructions that are given towards the end of Mark uh, with respect to sign gifts that are given to the apostles or apostolic associates, in this case, uh, the 70. In Luke 10, it says in verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And so, are we going to start ridiculing this passage too? Are we going to laugh about the fact that the 70 were given by Christ, the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions? Um, it seems very consistent with what Christ says to the apostles in the ending of Mark. As uh, Let me just read it directly. What it says in Mark chapter 16, uh, verses 17 and 18, as he lays out uh, the so-called sign gifts, and it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, why should that passage be ridiculed? Um, it's, it's a key instruction being given to the apostles. So um, anyways, but it's very often the case that people try um, uh, to ridicule this part of God's word. So, right, right. Nobody has doubts about that one, but nobody handles scorpions in their churches. Although here we could do that. For... Because that was an instruction to the 70, and it's not normative for ordinary church officers today. There's a much better explanation. Rather than ridiculing it, there's a perfectly consistent interpretation that can be given to those passages. In Arizona. That's right. So, I, But I want to hear Hickson's answer to that. Yeah, it's going to sound like a cop out. It's it's not. I agree <laughs> with basically every word that Pete said. Um, it is. So Hickson says he basically agrees with everything that Peter Gurry says. I find that kind of interesting because uh, Pastor Hickson points out in the previous podcast how he's working on the textual commentary for the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. And in the Tyndall House Greek New Testament that came out in 2017, one of the interesting things and even encouraging things about it is that they include Mark 16, 9 through 20 in the text proper of the Gospel of Mark with no brackets around it suggesting that it's original. Now, Dr. Hickson now is telling us, I agree 100% with Peter Gurry, but I wonder then, what did he write in the textual commentary? What input did he have? Because he told us previously that he and, and, and Dirk Yonkin are concerned for, for reconstruction of the autograph of the original text. But now he's telling us the Tender House Greek New Testament affirms, apparently, the authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20. But now he's telling us he agrees completely with, with Dr. Gurry. It's kind of interesting. Not very consistent. It's a difficult one for me. I don't think this, it's an easy textual decision. I think the, the woman caught in adultery, that often the two of them are kind of elevated to the same, the same category, and I don't think they're even remotely in the same category. Right. 
I don't think it's very difficult either. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, they're two different texts. I disagree with him. He says that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is difficult, though he ends up rejecting it. And uh, John 7, 53 through 8, 11 is more difficult, though he ends up rejecting it. So, and so in, in my view, he seems to have the same opinion about both of them. He rejects them. And on my side, I have the same opinion about them. I affirm them as being part of the text of scripture. And uh, I don't think that, uh, again, I, I, I've said before that Mark 16, 9 through 20, in my opinion, is a slam dunk. Um, that is, it, it's an easy decision because it's missing in only two very early manuscripts, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and then one other very late minuscule. And it's very prevalent in the Church Fathers. It's there in Justin Martyr. It's there in uh, the Dia Tesserone. It's there in Irenaeus of Lyon. It's, it's, it's there in second century writings of the Church Fathers. Um, no one even thinks about rejecting its authenticity um, there, there, uh, in the, uh, going into the modern period uh, until you get to the 19th century. There was a slight period of controversy about it, and maybe from the year 300 to 500 that shows up in some references that we read in Eusebius and that are repeated by other writers but pre-300, there's complete consensus. Post-500, there's complete consensus until you get to the 19th century. Um, but anyways, uh, let's listen to a little bit more from Dr. Pastor Hickson. I, right. um, I don't think the woman caught in adultery is a difficult textual decision. I do think the ending of Mark is. There are things to consider about Sonny and <clears throat> And Vaticanus, you know, such as if modern scholars can see a difference in the, the kind of voice of Mark's Greek there at the end, then ancient scholars probably could also. Right, uh, right. And if they could, what's to say that there wasn't some basically the same mindset? I mean, I think that's a difficult thing to wrestle with. And it's yeah, un yeah. unquestionably early, but at the same yeah. time, it is also unquestionably in. 1600 or so Greek manuscripts. Now, some of them do have notes saying some uh, in the old copies that doesn't have these verses or things like that. Um, and so there's other things to consider. So uh, at the end of the day, I, I do think that's one that we, we should leave in our Bibles, but Mark right with, with it. Right. All right. So he says that's his conclusion. It should be left in there. We should, it's spurious, but it should be left in because it has ancient usage and there should be brackets around it and there should be notes. Again, that's not what the Tyndall House Greek New Testament chose to do. They did not put brackets around it. Of course, they've got notes in the apparatus about it. Maybe he, maybe that's what he's talking about. And maybe that's what they'll do in the textual commentary. They'll say it's an ancient appendix, but because of ancient usage, we think it should be in there without the brackets around it. Uh, we'll see what in fact they say. It's kind of interesting that he's, he notes there um, well, the, the, if, if we today see problems with the Greek and the Markan, non markan style of Mark 16, 9 through 20, then probably ancient people did too. And this is one of the big problems that people have who reject the authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20, is they just can't find ancient writers who reject the authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20 because its Greek isn't consistent with the remainder of the Gospel of Mark. Ancient um, commentators on Mark 16, 9 through 20 didn't say that its Greek was non-Markan, and these were people whose native language was Greek, um, who were not studying it as a second language the way modern scholars are. They saw no problems with its consistency with the rest of the Gospel of Mark that no one challenges the authenticity of. Uh, let's go a little further. Right, here. I, and I would just just say, uh, and you know, let everyone be convinced in his own mind, right? Yeah, right. That, and that's where. It's what if you're convinced of something that's wrong? Does let everyone be convinced in its own mind apply to? You can come up with any um, text of scripture that you want. I mean, there is a place where you should be convinced in your own mind about what is true, and you should embrace what is true. That verse and that passage, though, is not getting warrant for anyone coming up with anything that they would like to affirm. 
if you if you take it in that kind of way, you could say, well, well, as long as Joseph Smith was convinced in his own mind that his views about Christianity and Jesus were right, we we can't question him. Certainly, we can challenge if we think someone has come to a wrong conclusion about what the text of the Bible is. I think given given that text's long history in the Bible, I as a so let's say I was a translator or a Bible publisher, I don't think it's my job to to tell all my readers, to, to answer, to resolve that question for all. That's a very interesting thing for someone who's committed himself and his career to textual criticism to say, but you know, as a translator or an editor, I don't think it's my job to tell the reader what I think the text of scripture is. Doesn't this, doesn't this contradict the pledge that was made in the previous episode that I'm committed to finding the original text? Um, but, but, but I'm, but you know, it, it, it's not the buck stops with me. It's the buck never stops with me. I want to tinker around with the text. I want to, you know, one day say that I think Mark 16, 9 through 20 should be included. And then later on have a shift. Was that a minor shift or a major shift? I want to have a shift and say, I don't think it's part of the text, but I don't think I should be telling the reader. Um, kind of reminds me of modern doctors who want never want to make any kind of authoritative uh, judgment and give you authoritative counsel about your health because they're so afraid that you might sue them. They don't want to make, they don't want to tell you anything definitive. They want to leave everything loose and let you kind of make up your own decisions. Does that sound like the spirit though of Christian preachers, teachers who should be uh, using the, the preparation, the training and the scholarship that they have in order to come to FERC firm conclusions and to preach not um, theories and hypotheses, but as Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Oh, my readers. Right, right, right. Because it is a difficult one. Now, I don't think the textual problem is, I mean, I, I totally agree with Hickson. Like there, all the manuscripts, there's so many manuscripts that have it, right? Mm -hmm. I think the- Man, they totally agree with each other. Break between verse eight and verse nine is so awkward. Mm. That there's no way that the break between eight and nine is so awkward, except that generation of Christians, Greek speaking Christians, never saw any problem with the transition between verses eight and nine. The same person wrote what came before. Like it's, yeah. it's awkward if you leave the break break there too, having an ending with the preposition gar there. It, apparently that yes. doesn't happen. Can happen. It just, I don't know that we have an example of it happening at the end of a narrative. Right. But. So he supposedly sees great problems in the transition to verses 8 and 9, but as Dwayne uh, Green points out, there's a huge grammatical problem with the suggestion that Mark would originally end at Mark 16, 8, and that is it would mean that the entire gospel would end with the post-positive particle gar. And um, Gurry wants to rush in and minimize uh, the significance of that because it would go against his idea that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not original. He never tells us, by the way, in this interview, well, well, where did Mark originally end? Did it originally end at Mark 16, 8? Was the ending lost? Uh, but if you were to pick up uh, in Clayton Croy's book, The Mutilation of Mark's Gospel, he has an interesting discussion of the, the whole idea of the possibility of Mark ending with the post-positive particle gar at Mark 16, 8. And uh, this book, uh, The Mutilation of Mark's Gospel by N. Clayton Croy, is published by that bastion of KJV onlyism, uh, Abingdon Press. Oh, that's a joke, by the way. But anyways, he says uh, here on pages 24 and 25, just, I'll just read the opening paragraph. Much of the early debate about Mark's conclusion at 16.8 centered on the stylistic awkwardness of an entire narrative ending with the words, for they were afraid. As is often pointed out, this ending is even more awkward in Greek since the conjunction for, or the Greek word gar, is in the final position. Gar is a post-positive particle, meaning that it cannot stand first in its clause. Its normal position is second, so it is far more common for words to follow gar than for it to end a sentence. The fact that gar was the very last word in this Gospel of Mark raised suspicion that something was amiss. Could a book end with gar? 
Scholars have called it, quote, no proper conclusion, impossibly er abrupt, and a shocking ending, end quote. And if you go to the footnote, it's footnote 18 on page 31, he lists some of the scholars who have said that, that it's unlikely that Mark would end, Mark, it would end with Mark 16, 8 and the post-positive particle gar. And he says, respectively, Boring, meaning Eugene Boring in 1990, Barclay, 1975, Van Ersel, 1988. He says, even scholars who accept 16.8 as Mark's intended ending recognize the, sharp, the harshness of the expression. Collins, 1993, for example, calls it, quote, a stupefyingly abrupt ending to the gospel, end quote. Perrin, meaning Norman Perrin, 1977, calls it, quote, grammatically barbarous, end quote. So um, at any rate, uh, there's a big problem with saying that Mark would end at Mark 16, 8, a huge grammatical problem that far surpasses any supposed uh, disconnect between the transition between verses 8 and 9. It can, it can certainly happen at the end of a sentence. It can happen at the end of a sentence. Presumably it could happen at right. the end of a, of right. a book. I, don't, I think it's unlikely because you have two promises or two, at least two foreshadowings in, in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is going to meet his disciples in Galilee, one of which is in Mark 16. And then you never have that. To me, it seems like Mark's Gospel itself, from what comes before, sets us up <coughs> to anticipate a meeting between Jesus yes. and his yeah. disciples in Galilee. So he makes a, a narratological argument against Mark 16, 9 through 20 being the, the proper ending because he says that there's an anticipation that Jesus is going to meet with the disciples in Galilee. There are two anticipations of this. Now, what I find interesting, though, is, and again, Dr. Gurry, unsurprisingly, never tells us precisely what it is that he believes. Does he believe Mark ends at Mark 16, 8? Well, if he believes Mark ends at Mark 16, 8, he's still got the same narrative problem with the Gospel of Mark because there's no narration of Jesus meeting with the disciples in Galilee if Mark ends at Mark 16, 8. Um, so that's that's an argument against Mark ending at Mark 16, 8. Does he think the ending is lost? Then he's rejected completely the doctrine of the providential preservation of Scripture. The thing we must assume is that there are anticipations of things that Jesus will do, and not all of those are recorded within the Gospel of Mark as it ends in verses 9 through 16. However, it does include in, uh, in, in Mark 16, 9 through 20, rather, I should have said, it does include the account of the ascension. It does include the account of uh, Christ ascending and being seated at the right hand of God. And what Gary doesn't address is if you take Mark 16, 9 through 20 out, you have a gospel with no resurrection appearances. Paul in 2 Corinthians 15 Verses 3 through 5 says that the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, uh, that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Resurrection appearances are essential to the gospel. And so he's making much to do about there not being recorded in Mark 16, 9 through 20, the resurrection appearances of Jesus to the disciples in Galilee, but Mark 16, 9 through 20 does include what is vital and essential and is a sine qua non of the Gospels, and that is it includes the resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus. Allie, but it's hard because we're trying to imagine, well, what would we write? That's right. You know, and well, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't really matter. Well, no, no. Right, like, yeah, what would we write? How could we improve on the Gospel? Well, that's not what we should do. We should be taking the, the gospel as it is and as it has been preserved for us. Because you're not Mark, so. Yeah, yeah. so full disclosure, I mean, I, I think that Mark is original. I think you All right, I'm going to pause right here. Um, we've been going for quite a while in this discussion. And as I pointed out, I think there's some significant problems with the interpretations that Dr. Gurry and Pastor Hickson give on the traditional ending of Mark. 
Um, in particular, I reject this view that Gurry says he just wants to treat Mark 16, 9 through 20 the way the Protestant Reformers and the Protestant Orthodox did. The Protestant Reformers and the Protestant Orthodox did not take apocryphal works and intersperse them among the canonical works and put them in brackets and give interpretive footnotes. No, they put the Apocrypha in a separate section and their confessions of faith. They made a clear distinction between the canonical books and non-canonical books. So you're not following in the footsteps of the Reformers and the Protestant Orthodox when you put brackets around uh, parts of the scriptures and uh, or, or, or other uh, spurious, uninspired works and put them in the text of scripture as long as they have footnotes. That's not following in the footsteps of the Protestant Reformers or the Protestant Orthodox. Again, what we find with those, even evangelicals, who embrace the modern critical text is that we have a text that is never fixed, it's never firm, it's never completely settled. I mean, think about what Gurry has told us. At one point, he believed that Mark 16, 9 through 20 should be in the text, but now his ideas have shifted and he doesn't believe it should be in the text. Now, he's just one scholar. His view of, disagrees with other people who use the same method. The, the editors of the Tento House Greek New Testament have taken away the brackets and they say it should be in the text. So there's, there's, this is one of the huge problems with those who embrace the modern critical text is they don't come up with the same answers. And even one scholar can change his opinion. Um, are we really going to wait on Peter Gurry to tell us whether or not Mark 16, 9 through 20 should be in the Bible or not? Are we going to wait for him to tell us whether we should preach upon it or not? I don't think so. I'm not waiting for that. We have the received text. It includes Mark 16, 9 through 20 as part of the inspired canonical text of the Gospel of Mark. We can gladly embrace it. We can uh, use it as the church and generations before us has used it to be a standard. Um, we can use it for forming doctrine like the doctrine of cessationism. We can use it for preaching and teaching and counseling God's people. Well, this is going to bring this episode of Word Magazine to a conclusion. I hope that this episode has been helpful to those who are listening, and I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next Word Magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.